Hello, and welcome to the Center for Independent Studies. My name is Peter Curti. I'm a research scholar at the CIS, and it's a great pleasure to have your company for this conversation about the psychology of populism and the challenges it is said to pose to liberal democracy. Well, to talk about this, I'm joined from Budapest by my guest, Professor Joe Forgas, who is Scientia Professor of Psychology at the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. And he's the author of a recent essay published by the CIS called The Psychology of Populism, Tribal Challenges to Liberal Democracy. Joe, a very warm welcome to the CIS. As I said, you're joining us from Hungary this evening, but it's a country you left as a young man a long time ago. Let me start by asking you, what do you see as some of the key differences between the Hungary of that era and the Hungary of today? 1969, I left uh, because Hungary at that time was a communist country. Uh, Soviet troops were uh, located in Hungary, and it was a monolithic dictatorship, which means that every sphere of life was totally controlled by the Communist Party. And I felt at the age of 22, that this is unlikely to change in my lifetime. And I did not want to live my entire life in a system that essentially denied all fundamental individual and human rights. So my escape from Hungary was quite an adventurous one. I actually crossed the Yugoslavia-Austria border in the boot of a car. Uh, but I eventually managed to get to Austria and I was uh, admitted as an assisted migrant to Australia in 1969. And in 1970, I started to go to university and my life changed. If I look at Hungary today, it seems to me that some of the very same characteristics are in evidence again today. Hungary currently is essentially a one party state. A single party has acquired power in 2010 and since then has proceeded to systematically destroy all of the institutions of a usual democracy. So <clears throat> the public broadcaster, 90% of the media, the public prosecutor's office, the justice system have all been uh, subjugated by the ruling party at the moment. The oppression is not the same as in the communist era, but nevertheless, Hungary today, again, is a country that if I was 22 years old, I would certainly consider leaving. Well, when we think of populism today, we often think of politicians such as Viktor Orban, Donald Trump, or of processes like Brexit. What, if anything, do you think that these forms of populism and populist leader have in common? I think there is a common denom denominator in the processes and the strategies and the propaganda they use, even though there are, the content of populist movements can be very different. They can espouse right-wing or left-wing ideologies. The common denominator is that populism claims to be representing the people, all of the people, and does not allow for any deviation or any challenge to the political position that they represent. On the right wing, populists typically apply to ethno-nationalist ideologies, to sometimes racist ideologies, to visions of history that define a group, and they claim to represent all of the people against anybody who would deny their political position. On the left, probably the best example of a well-worked-out populist uh, ideology is Marxism, which in a similar way claims to have understood the message of history, claims to have established a scientific foundation for predicting how society should work, does not allow any deviation or debate about this uh, so-called truth, and wants to carry out its program against all comers. So the common denominator is that populism is a morally absolutist uh, belief system where there is no space for checks and balances and alternatives or tolerance. Uh, and we see different versions of populism in different parts of the world today. I think in Hungary, Orban, in Russia, Putin, in Turkey, Erdogan, uh, in Israel, Netanyahu, have certain similarities in uh, denying the legitimacy of opposition and trying to exploit 
populist feeling. On the left, I see that mostly in the United States or in England, where uh, racial equality movements, Black Lives Matter, woke ideology, critical race theory, have exactly the same characteristics of absolutist beliefs, intolerance towards any divergence, and potentially a violent hatred of anybody who does not support their view of the world. Well, now your critics might say, and some of them do say, that what you're really concerned about or what they think you're really concerned about is that the so-called elites might be losing their influence over the masses. Isn't scepticism about populism basically a scepticism about democracy? I think the fundamental difference between populism and democracy is that they both claim to represent popular will. Democracy is a carefully worked out system of rules, checks, and balances, which recognizes majority will, but also institutes very carefully thought out limits on how far the majority will can be carried out against the minority. Populism is an absolutist ideology, which does not recognize the legitimacy of any opposition to that particular uh, point of view. When it comes to elites, uh, of course it is true that elites themselves can be beholden to populist ideology. Uh, and I would totally accept the view that some of the elites in Western liberal democracies have become beholden to leftist ideologies that most of the voters no longer share. But populism is not a question of being in a majority. It's a question of believing of being in a majority. So elites can be the drivers of populist ideology as much as uh, uh, the right-wing populists like Orban. In fact, populists typically do not represent the majority. They just claim to represent an incontrovertible ideology that nobody has a right to challenge. The key point here is that they deny the insight of, insights of John Stuart Mill going back in the uh, uh, centuries ago, that the only way democracy can work is if we listen to other people, we have open debate, we have open discussion, and we have tolerance. Anybody who denies that in the name of the righteousness of their cause is potentially a populist. But if populism is popular, um, it, it, it's hard, sometimes it's hard to see how populism actually does threaten democracy because democracy is about the demos, the people, don't the people also care about freedom of the individual? And doesn't your argument actually devalue the demos, the people? I think the demos is never homogeneous. The demos is always complex. There are multiple views, multiple, uh, multiple ideologies, sometimes conflicting ideologies. So nobody really has an absolute right to claim the demos. The demos essentially is an amalgam of different views. And the very essence of democracy is that we try to recognize that these views can be conflicting and we allow for the possibility of peaceful change in power. What populists typically do is claim to have a universal handle on righteousness and deny the rights of the opposition. Viktor Orban in Hungary is again an excellent example. When he lost an election, he declared that the motherland, that means him and his cronies, cannot be in opposition. He claims to represent the entire nation. And anybody who happens to disagree with him suffers discrimination and retortions. That is the problem with populism. It does not recognize the possibility of alternative views. Let me ask you a question from um, one of our audience members, Gabriella, who points out that Orban came to power in 2010 in an election at which 47% of registered voters turned out. Since then, participation in elections has significantly increased, though still in the last election in 2018 only reached 68%. So her question is, is Orban's power due to the fact that he can mobilize his base or does he just benefit from a large number of disengaged voters who don't trust the system and therefore don't vote? 
both of these claims are true. He has been very successful in mobilizing uh, probably about two, two and a half million of the eight million voters in Hungary who have become true believers, so totally convinced of his righteousness. But he also has done a lot of other things. When he came to power, he introduced a new constitution for which he had no popular mandate. The only party that supported this constitution was his own party. He changed the electoral law in such a way that he made it practically impossible for the opposition to be successful. Hungary is a multi-party democracy in terms of its institutions, and Orban instituted an electoral law uh, on a two-party system to make his own party the only one that is capable of winning a majority. He then eliminated the usual checks and balances. There were very significant accusations of electoral fraud in the elections in 2014 and 2018. The Electoral Commission is in the hands of his supporters. The public prosecutor is his man and totally refuses to investigate corruption. The richest man in Hungary is Orban's childhood friend, Lorenz Mesaros, who now apparently has more money than Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, when Orban came to power, he was a turner and gas fitter in a country village. Now, this is the kind of country ha that Hungary has become under Orban. It is true that he has been extremely successful in manipulating the electoral process, partly by using uh, divisive, xenophobic, misleading propaganda, partly by undermining the usual checks and balances that work in a democracy, and to a significant extent by creating around himself a group of voters who, uh, who essentially are persuaded by Orban's vulgar nationalism. His propaganda is always Hungarians are denied their rights, Hungarians are uh, discriminated against. Exactly the same kind of ideology, by the way, that uh, in times gone past, Mussolini, Hitler, Goebbels employed. We are not being dealt fairly. Everybody is against us. Orban is fighting against the European Union, who actually provides about 4% of Hungary's national income. He's fighting against Soros, George Soros, whom he considers an international conspirator. So if you look at the propaganda that surrounds you in Hungary, it is eerily reminiscent of the kind of right-wing propaganda that uh, quasi-fascist regimes used in the past. And I'm not alone with that view. Madeleine Albright, who was the foreign secretary in the Clinton administration, wrote a very interesting book entitled Fascism, A Warning, where she describes exactly the same techniques and mechanisms that right-wing populist leaders who come to power employ, including Viktor Orban. Now, th that brings us quite nicely to your essay, because you have investigated um, and made an argument about the psychological roots of populism. You issue a warning, in fact, that populism appeals to those deeply ingrained tribal instincts, which are then activated and turned into a political force. Now, you cast that in negative terms, but is it necessarily and invariably a bad thing that those instincts are activated and turned into a political force? Very good and very interesting question. No, it's not necessarily a bad thing. The way I see it is that human beings, you know, the human species, homo sapiens, owes our success and survival to our amazing ability to form cohesive groups. You know, for 200,000 years, the reason why we are still here is because we are far better in organizing ourselves into groups that guarantee our survival. One consequence of that is all human beings alive today are the progeny of thousands of generations where group mind uh, fitting into a group has been naturally selected. So in a, way, in a way, human beings have been naturally selected to be good group members. Uh, the problem with that is that the collectivist attitude that we all have doesn't sit easily with the ideology of the Enlightenment, the individualism that serves as the foundation of modern liberal democracy. Up till about the 18th century, all human civilizations 
functioned because people shared a belief system that made them into a cohesive group. It might have been a religion, it might have been a, a, a set of customs, habits. These are very important in making human groups function. The Enlightenment introduced the notion that you don't just have to be a group member, you can be an individual, you can make your own choices, your life doesn't have to be determined by the particular class, society, ethnicity that you've been born into. And that caused an explosion of human creativity. I think most people would agree that the world we live in today is the most successful, richest, most tolerant, in many ways, the best human civilization has ever been. And that is based on an ideology of individualism. So the problem is we have a conflict between the assumptions and the requirements of liberal democracy, which is individualism, tolerance, equality, liberty, and the natural tendencies of human thinking, which are towards uh, group thinking. Uh, there are some really interesting experiments in social psychology that show that it takes almost nothing for people to hate another person and discriminate against another person just because they belong to a different group. Henri Tachfel, a social psychologist at the University of Bristol, uh, carried out a series of experiments where he found that if you totally arbitrarily assign people into two groups, for example, by flipping a coin, and you say, uh, the first group is the heads and the other group is the tails. And then you give these people a task where they have to allocate, let's say, money between two individuals about whom they know nothing, except that one of them is in the head group and the other one is in the tail group. And that totally meaningless manipulation is sufficient for people to engage in discrimination. People will tend to give more to their in-group, even though that group has no meaning, no tradition, no past, no future, and transparently pointless. Now, that is the danger, I think, that liberal democracies face. Once we start dividing humanity into identity groups, racial groups, ethnic groups, national groups, the almost inevitable consequence is animosity and conflict. And the only way in my, my mind to overcome this is to go back to the fundamental idea that what matters is not the group, but the individual. So as soon as an individual stops thinking for themselves, um, the threat of populism gets more real and, um, uh, and it's easier for a populist leader to activate that, polit that latent political force is really what you're saying. Absolutely. The, 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 the political messages which are the easiest and most, most effective is the kind of populist messages. And for a long time after the Second World War, it was simply not accepted that liberal democracies use those sorts of messages. When somebody reaches back to them, like Donald Trump did, and talks about make America great again, or in Brexit, uh, you know, the slogan was take back control. Once you engage in that kind of political rhetoric, it's very easy to exploit the frustrations, often genuine frustrations, and the need for an explanation that social groups have. Orban's propaganda is almost exclusively based on a kind of traditional sense of Hungarian inferiority, uh, kind of narcissism, an idea that Hungarians are better than almost everybody else, but nobody is recognizing that, that we are fighting a struggle against others. This seems kind of slightly childish when you listen to it, but people like it. It appeals to them because that kind of group identity has a very powerful hold on the individual. Let me go to a question now from Glenn, and it picks up a point you were making earlier about left-wing and right-wing forms of populism. Glenn asks, was the Occupy movement of a few years ago an example of left-wing populism? And do you think that there are lessons to draw from its ultimate defeat in the light of current left-wing and other populist movements of today? I think it would be, I would classify it as populist because it's the kind of ideology that does not recognize any opposition or any alternative. So people participating in it thought they were the true repository of popular will, just like the occupation of capital in the United States was like that. So populism is hallmarked by a total intolerance towards any questioning or alternatives. And 
I think, if anything, uh, left-wing populism has become more radical since then and more dangerous. I mean, daily, when I talk to my academic colleagues in the United States and England, I hear about unbelievable intolerance and essentially Leninist tactics against people who do not fall in line with the woke ideology, uh, with the gender ideology, with the, you know, there's a whole bunch of these collectivist ideologies that are totally incompatible with the individualist tradition of the Enlightenment. And yet these are becoming widely accepted uh, by some elites, I have to say, uh, at universities, at organizations, in political systems. So I think the, the populist radicalization, if anything, has gotten more serious in recent years. But we've talked about populist leaders like Donald Trump or Viktor Orban or others. But from what you're saying there, it sounds as though the real problems with populism or the real seeds that give rise to populism are so not so much by political leaders, but on university campuses where certain ideas and ideologies are promulgated. Uh, identity politics is promulgated on uh, on university campuses, notions of harm, wokeism. Once people are alerted to those sorts of sensibilities and sensitivities, really. Isn't, aren't, we, aren't the universities simply preparing another generation of people who are vulnerable to, susceptible to the appeal of populist leaders? I don't know, because, you know, predicting the future is not easy, but I, I find it very concerning that university campuses and particularly in the arts and the humanities have been to a significant extent taken over by people who no longer subscribe to the values of the enlightenment and tolerance. They have one view of the world and they push it at every turn. Uh, and I think the problem with that is that uh, others will react with equally polarized and extreme reactions. So I think what you see in the United States is essentially the culmination of many years of growing popular polarization. It probably started in the Reagan years when the progressive Democrats did not accept that Reagan could be a legitimate president. It continued uh, in the Bush administration and people on the right then in turn did not accept Obama to be a legitimate president. So this idea that one particular group becomes polarized and extreme and subscribes their populist ideology inevitably results on the other side becoming also polarized and equally intolerant. It's a kind of a chicken and the egg problem. You see it on both on the left and the right. You see it in uh, the, the left-wing radical move movements like uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter, which is essentially based on race as the defining characteristic of people. And you see it on the right, uh, you know, the Trump supporters who refuse to believe that he was not re-elected. It kind of becomes more extreme and the two sides play on each other. And what gets lost in the middle is the idea that truth is never that simple and truth is never the property of one group. Michael uh, has got a question, and he actually makes the point that, uh, and I think we'd agree with it, that Trump, Donald Trump on the right, seems to be a more obvious example of a populist leader. Um, but Michael asks whether the left, uh, which seems to be more about wokeism and is less formalized, he wonders if it's actually more pervasive and therefore more dangerous. I don't know whether it's more pervasive, certainly in demographic terms. I think the people who subscribe to these ideologies are relatively small in number, but they're strong in influence. Uh, in, universities play a major role in training lawyers, public servants, uh, teachers. So they have a major influence on thinking. And when this kind of ideology takes hold in universities, it does spread out to other fields. And we have seen in recent years that legal decisions are corporations adopt uh, these kind of populist walk uh, slogans. So I see it as dangerous, but in terms of numbers, I, I, don't think this, uh, I don't think they are a majority, but they have a disproportionate influence. If there was an election on some of those issues, I think they would be in a very small minority. But the problem is that they, essentially what they do in my view, uh, and you know, many people may disagree with that, 
essentially they they follow on the Marxist ideology. You know, Marxism is, to my mind, one of the best examples of a well worked out populist ideology. It claims to have understood how economics works, how the market system works, how history works. It claims to be a scientific credo, and it has a utopistic idea at the end of it. And it's attractive because it has the key features of populism. It's simple. Anybody can understand it. It offers certainty. Now we know. Now we understand. And it gives you moral superiority. If I believe it, I'm on the side of the angels. I'm fighting for uh, human happiness. And so Marxism, when it became untenable in its classical form, because the proletarian revolution never happened and Marxist societies were horrible, transformed itself into this system called cultural Marxism, which emanated from the Frankfurt School, which basically argued that, well, the proletariat isn't going to do a revolution, but maybe we can mobilize other groups who suffer or think they suffer injustice. And uh, a number of ideologies have come forth from that gender ideology, multiculturalism, uh, anti-racism, critical race theory, these have the common characteristic that they identify a group who needs to engage in revolutionary struggle to gain freedom and equality. And that is essentially the definition of uh, populism. But if populism is popular, how would you respond to uh, critics of your position who say that populism is simply a label for political programs which attract support, but which intellectuals don't like? Isn't that a fair criticism? Well, not quite, because intellectuals really like wokeism, or at least some of them do. Quite a lot of intellectuals in the West are still Marxists, which I class as an absolutely populist ideology. So intellectuals are just as prone to populist ideologies as non-intellectuals. And also, uh, populism has rarely, uh, really has acquired a majority status. It's just that some leaders and some movements uh, claim to speak in the name of the people, all the people, but they rarely do. Certainly the left-wing populist movements at universities don't speak for the majority. And I would argue equally, Orban doesn't speak for the majority of Hungarians. He's managed to get re-elected three times with about a quarter of the popular vote. Hitler was elected with about 30% of the popular vote and then grabbed power. Uh, populism is very effective in putting together a, 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 a significant coalition, but it's not usually a majority coalition in terms of the demographics of all voters. It just claims to speak for everybody. And yet democratically elected governments seldom speak for all the people. Um, I mean, it, whether it's in Australia, the United Kingdom or the United States, uh, the democratically elected leader always will have to be mindful of a substantial portion of the electorate that didn't support their candidacy. So isn't that just a fact of, of democratic life, really? Uh, that's essentially the, the, the core characteristic of democracy, that it's not absolutist. It, 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 it uses popular mandate, but it's mindful of the divergent opinions. And it is recognizing the role of an opposition, for example. The big difference between a liberal democracy and Orban's Hungary, that in a liberal democracy, the opposition is a significant, important, essential part of good governance. You need a well-functioning opposition to make governance effective. In Orban's eyes, the opposition are evil doers who work against the interests of the people. Orban is in the record of having declared many times that those who don't agree with him are enemies of the nation, and they are in the pay of uh, Jewish oligarchs like uh, Soros. His total incapacity to understand that he is not the only repository of wisdom, that you need other voices, and they need to be listened to. And this is, I but think, again, yep. This is where no, no, populism yep. differs from democracy. But let's go to the United States then, where it's easier for non-Hungarian speakers to follow political uh, developments, because I think that the, the language does present a problem for outsiders to observe. But in the United States, we see people on the left, the Democrats, uh, taking just the same sorts of views about their political opponents as the Republicans do of their political opponents. Uh, it, those who oppose the the, the uh, a particular position are portrayed, they're presented as 
uh, with a great deal of persistence as being enemies of the people. Um, and the, Dem the Democrats do that as much as the Republicans do. They do, and that's, uh, I think that has evolved over probably several decades since the 1980s. And I agree that the Democrats are just as guilty of polarization and intolerance as are the Republicans. And the way I would interpret this is that uh, it's the group mind, the group think, all right thinking people think like that, has gradually taken over the American uh, political norms. I mean, the United States is famous for recognizing checks and balances and respect for alternative views. And I think that has disappeared or is disappearing from political discourse. And I totally agree that Democrats are just as guilty of that as Republicans. The reason why we focus on Republicans because Trump is a unique phenomenon. I mean, here is a president who is disdainful of his own administration, who is uh, disdainful of his own uh, minister, justice uh, secretary, who thinks the press is his enemy, who essentially, in a way, he is most clearly embodies the idea that if I'm speaking for the people, that nobody has any right to have any opinions other than mine. Uh, the fact that he is lying regularly, that's also a common feature of populism. If there is only one truth, then I'm willing to lie because the truth triumphs. You know, Marxists are very good at that too. I mean, their interpretation of history has always been subjugated to the power of their ideology. Ideology is more important than facts or truth. And that's the same with Trump. So uh, Trump essentially embodies a populist leader more than any democratic president has done in the past. Certainly a leader like Donald Trump is able to evoke a, a kind of a national story or a national narrative that has a great deal of appeal for people. And I think populist leaders like uh, like Netanyahu did that in Israel. And I guess Orban does it in, uh, in Hungary. And, and there was recently a, a, a well a, a well-publicized interview that Tucker Carlson uh, from Fox News in the States did with, with Orban. One of the things that came through, and it picks up a question that we have from Chris, um, who asks whether or not the rise of Orban is actually to be associated more with uh, the, the, the tough position, and this is something that Tucker Carlson brought out, I think, whether it's about Orban's tough position on uh, on immigration and migration policy and his disdain for the EU, all part of, I would suggest, all part of a, of a, of a narrative um, about a country, in this instance, Hungary, but something, a, a narrative that could easily be spun by a, a successful and effective populist leader about any other country. That's a very interesting point. I watched Tucker Carlson and I understand what's happening. I think uh, what Orban says for a Western audience is very different from what Orban communicates to a Hungarian audience. Since Hungarians typically don't speak foreign languages, he has been very adept in communicating different messages. His message, or uh, which is essentially anti-gender ideology against open migration, against some of the, the, the radical progressive imposed ideologies on the West. I happen to actually agree with, I think he's right. But he's saying those things, not because they are issues in Hungary. Hungary does not suffer from gender ideology or immigration. Most immigrants don't want to stay here. They want to go on to Germany or Austria. So Hungary is not actually under threat from potential migrants. What Orban does is uses these messages to generate fear and xenophobia and support for himself. Now, as far as Westerners are concerned, like Tucker Carlson and some academics I know, who support Orban because he says the kind of things they themselves believe, I think there's a real danger there that when you want to fight the creeping uh, totalitarianism at universities, you should be very careful in who you choose as your friends. I think it's a great mistake to choose another uh, dictatorial leader just because he happens to say some of the same things you believe in. In Orban's case, I am convinced that he's uh, making these messages, he's communicating out of a, a totally manipulated perspective. These are not issues that Hungary in Hungary matter. He's saying that because he can acquire support from right-wing or libertarian uh, 
Westerners who like to hear what he says. So he tailors. He, he, he tailors his messages, and uh, he's not a, to my mind, he's not a persuasion politician. He is an absolutely opportunistic politician who does what populist leaders always do. He's actually using uh, what used to be called useful idiots in the West. Uh, I was surprised, for example, that Roger Scruton, whom I respect, accepted a decoration from Orban. I was surprised that Douglas Murray, whom I also respect, was willing to come to the Danube Institute and be the guest of the Hungarian government. I think people who believe in liberty and democracy should not allow themselves to be paid off by right-wing populists just because they oppose left-wing populists. I think there's a, 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 a medium position, a libertarian position, an enlightenment position, where we reject both the totalitarianism of the left and the totalitarianism of the right. So uh, an image, a message rather, is tailored deliberately to present, um, in Orban's case, a hardline image to, to the West? Yes, and I think Tucker Carlson fell for it uh, completely. I mean, Tucker Carlson presumably knows nothing about Hungary and cares even less. Uh, but as long as he gets, a, you know, firstly, he gets an audience and he can represent Orban as this valiant leader who stands up to political correctness, people will watch his programs. I think it was a totally irresponsible and ill-advised uh, communication on his part, because in trying to stand up to the creeping left-wing totalitarianism, he ends up supporting an already in power right-wing totalitarianism. And uh, I can't believe that if you really believe in human freedom, dignity, liberty, and tolerance, you should be doing that. An interesting question from Anthony, who asks, do you think that, whether, do you think that populism could be understood as a reaction to the perception that ordinary people have that they are facing uh, a hostile and, and possibly indifferent plutocracy? Yes, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think what has been happening in, uh, in many uh, liberal countries, liberal democratic countries, is that the leadership has become essentially separated from masses of the voting population who feel ignored and sidetracked. So there is some legitimacy to reactions to, uh, to this kind of migration is a good case. I'm sure that the majority of Germans would not have voted to accept over a million refugees of unknown uh, provenance. Uh, I think migration has been a major stimulant to right-wing populism in most European countries and presumably in the United States as well. As a migrant myself, I firmly believe that uh, nations and countries have a right to decide who comes there and they have a right to, to select them. There is no universal human right to come and go and live wherever you want to. It's not a sustainable proposition. Uh, so yes, and the fact that the, the, the elites have subscribed to an ideology which basically emphasizes the humanitarian needs of the refugees and totally ignores the preferences of their voters is a recipe for creating populism, mainly right-wing populism. Le Pen, alternative for Deutschland, you know, in every Western European country now, including Holland and Denmark, there is a significant right-wing populist movement which has been brought about by the migration policies of those countries. Do you think that in a country like Australia, with a compulsory voting system, um, we have uh, uh, something of a safeguard against the, the rise of populism? I, and I think because that could well be that with a compulsory voting system, the electorate is actually more engaged uh, than it might otherwise be because you have to t turn out. And I think it, often election campaigns, it seems to me, are fought on the margins rather than for the center ground because the vast majority, of, when I say the margins, the marginal voter, the, the, the vast majority of, of voters do know what they want to vote for, how they're going to vote. And in fact, we're seeing, in my view, a problem with that because too many people are casting their votes before election day. But compulsory voting leads to a more engaged electorate. Do you think an engaged electorate is a safeguard against populism? 
On balance, I think compulsory voting is a good thing, particularly in Australia's case, because it eliminates that very large group of people, for example, in Hungary, who simply don't vote because they disengaged and they fed up with the entire political process. So asking people to vote is a good thing. I also think the Australian voting system, the optional preferential system, is probably a superior system to other alternatives. So Australia, in that sense, I think is in a good position. I also think Australia has made probably the best response to the migration issue. I think in the in the Howard years, when unlimited migration has become a popular issue, the response that we are going to take on political refugees, but we are not going to take on anybody who arrives, was the sensible reaction. And since then, you can see that in European countries, they're following a similar policy. Denmark uh, more recently has instituted a system which is very similar to Australia's system. The problem is that this is 10 or 20 years too late, and a lot of the political damage has already been done. So yes, I think the Australian political system works better in that respect. You say it's the tribal habits that are deeply ingrained in each of us that make us vulnerable to populism. But in a, in a liberal democracy, isn't a kind of collective cooperation also necessary for a cohesive civil society? And isn't this social civic component also somewhat tribal? We can't completely shed the tribal Absolutely not. I think it's, you know, part of human nature. Yeah, we are never going to get rid of it, certainly not in any time soon. So yes, it's very important to mobilize those tribal allegiances, but they always have to be limited by the recognition that other people have an equal right and that we have to be tolerant and listen to them and not regard them as enemies, but regard them as a source of useful, productive input into better decisions. It's essentially, the way I think about it historically, the enlightenment, the idea, what I just expressed is what John Stuart Mill wrote about. We have to listen to the other person because nobody has a privilege of all the wisdom. Unless we listen to each other, we are going to make mistakes and we are going to damage the very groups that we want to serve. Uh, this recognition didn't come to humanity easily. If you remember, the Enlightenment happened after three or four hundred years of the most unspeakable bloodshed in Europe, the religious wars. About 40% of the population of Europe has been killed in the name of Catholicism against Protestantism. And it's the outcome of this pointless populist uh, bloodshed that finally the Enlightenment came up with the idea that maybe nobody is absolutely right. Maybe we don't have to kill people just because they don't believe in transubstantiation or the virgin birth. Maybe we should separate church and state, and maybe we should listen to other people and have a system where we accept the truth. Is nobody, it's the, not, not one group and not one individual's privilege. Truth is something that emerges from open debate. And I think that is what we are losing. We're losing the fundamental rule of tolerance and acceptance of alternative views. Uh, and that's what I see both on the left and the right. Orban tries to uh, annihilate his enemies and at universities in the United States, woke academics try to sack those who disagree with them. It's the same kind of behavior. That's really interesting because towards the end of your essay, uh, you say this, you say that populist claims about betrayal of the people by the elites often contain an element of truth. But isn't that element of truth precisely what validates populist claims? No, it validates democracy. If there is an element of truth in the resentment, and usually is, then it should be played out in a democratic system where we listen to those complaints, we take them seriously and we act upon them. I mean, this is what democracy is supposed to be all about. Populism doesn't recognize the validity of any alternative truth, only its own. Democracy, by definition, recognizes the potential validity of alternative truth and allows for those to be played out in the political sphere. So but where populism goes wrong, even if it might have a legitimate grievance, it turns this grievance into an absolute and non-negotiable position rather than accept that other people might have other opinions and its resolution has to be some kind of a compromise uh, working towards a consensus. That is what's lacking 
in populist ideology. And yet surely if a populist leader seizes on that kernel of of truth in the narrative and spins that narrative into something that has greater and broader electoral appeal, that is using truth and developing, uh, as it were, a truthful narrative in just the way that other democratically leaders, uh, democratically elected leaders do as well. Isn't it about taking an essential component, a kernel of truth, and using that as a way of formulating a, an effective political position? Yes, absolutely. I mean, most populist leaders, most populist propaganda do contain a kernel of truth. You know, Hitler had a point in Germany in the 1930s. Mussolini had a point in, in Italy. Uh, there is some truth in, in those claims. The problem is that then those claims become absolute and everything else gets ignored and alternative positions are denied and personal and group animosity is accepted as the way of resolving the conflict. It's essentially violating the fundamental rules of how disagreements should be handled. Uh, of course, it's not the case that all populist uh, propaganda is totally untrue. There is always an element of truth in it, but this element of truth can be blown out of all proportion until it becomes an absolute belief system that is unchallengeable and doesn't accept any alternatives. So what do you think is it, it is, is it that holds back the, let's call them the respectable parties, um, what is it that holds them back from taking up important social issues um, because their failure to do so leaves them to the parties we might call unrespectable? Why is it that this ground is seeded? I think it's not seeded. It's, uh, Roger Scruton wrote about this, and I think he was perfectly right that the solution that we advocate is not terribly exciting. There are, there are in, uh, substantial handicaps in the liberal conservative position. We are not certain. We're not offering people absolute certainty. Uh, we are not simple. Life is complex. Politics is complex. The world is complex. Solutions are never simple. We cannot really bask in the, in the reflected glory of moral superiority because we don't really know how things will work out. Populists have the advantage by offering simplicity, certainty, and moral superiority. So the, the difficulty that people in the middle, where I consider myself located, face is that our message is not all that exciting. It took a long time for this idea to develop in the, in the 18th century with the Enlightenment. And once we allow populists to speak the way they do, they can more easily sway people than us in the middle. All we have to say is, you know, we try to improve things, we are tolerant, we listen to the other people, we hope things will get better, we'll go forward. Uh, we believe in the values that, you know, our uh, civilization was based about. That's not that exciting. If somebody says, well, look, I understand history, I understand economics, I know the future, do this, and utopia will come, well, that's kind of attractive, isn't it? And that, that, that works both on the left and the right. I'm going to use that uh, as a good point to bring us back from Hungary to Australia. Now, you've been overseas for much of the, uh, the really long dr draconian lockdown that we've had in Australia since the middle of the year. To what extent do you think government responses over the last 18 to 20 months to the COVID pandemic, to what extent do you think those government responses have been populist? And I ask the question because uh, notions of the ideas of certainty, of safety, security, uh, all wrapped up in the language of public health, I think have done a great deal to, to fuel compliance uh, and also not just to fuel compliance, but to cause those who dissent from the prevailing point of view to be, to be vilified. So I wonder what you think, from your, from, from your perch in Budapest, what do you think of what's been going on here in Australia and what awaits you when you come back? Uh, I think that the pandemic has really presented an, an absolutely uh, almost unimaginable situation. Firstly, it's a totally uncertain situation. Nobody really knew what was going to happen. There were simulations, predictions, most of them didn't come true. Every nation had slightly different rules. Every nation responded differently. In Australia, every state responded differently. Uh, in the early part of the pandemic, uh, when we had no vaccination, 
I think it was logical that only a collective response will be effective. So at that point, it was necessary to do something that applies to everybody equally. In the later part of the pandemic, once vaccination becomes uh, widely available, I think it changes. A collective response is no longer required because people as individuals can make an individual choice. They can choose to be vaccinated and be safe or if they, for whatever reason, in my mind, incorrectly refuse to be vaccinated, then they choose to accept a risk. At that point, I think governments uh, no longer should play a dominant role in determining what everybody does. Once we have individual options, the collective option should be superseded. I also think that the, that the restrictions, which were very different in each state, to some extent run a real danger of undermining popular trust in the system of the liberal democratic system, because people can see for themselves that everybody is doing something different and essentially nobody knows. In Europe, some countries have no quarantine requirements, some have five days, some have 10 days, some have 14 days, some have compulsory testing, some don't, some have lockdown, some don't. So if a well-informed individual looks around, they can say, well, it cannot be that all of these are equally justified. So there are questions in your mind as to what is going on and why they're doing it to me. I also think there is a danger that uh, when a common threat like this emerges, then there is a natural tribal tendency to pull together. I, I sometimes use this metaphor in the Stone Age, when a terrible thing happened to the tribe, the shaman would turn up and would say, you know, go dance around the oak tree 15 times to the left and five times to the right and everything will be all right. And people will go and do it because it will give them the illusion of safety and security. And there is a bit of that in the restrictions. They're not quite as unreasonable, but people think, okay, if I only do this properly, I'll be safe. We are willing to suspend rational judgments for safety. So what about vaccine passports, which are a means of an electronic means of proving to the government and proving to your neighbor that you've also done the right thing? It, it, that will be part of the, part, that will be something um, that would be re repressive, restrictive? Yes, and divisive and very damaging. I personally am against that. Once vaccination is available to everybody, everybody should be free to choose. And we can, uh, I think we should not lock down everybody in order to defend those who are not vaccinated, but equally, we should not exclude those who are not vaccinated from normal life. I think the vaccine passport is a, is a typical case of a kind of tribal response. I'm vaccinated and now you must be just like me. I personally think every reasonable person should be vaccinated, absolutely. Uh, but if for whatever reason somebody decides not to, it's not appropriate for the majority to impose restrictions on them. They are essentially taking a risk with their own life and health. And we allow that in many spheres of life. We don't stop people from skiing. We don't stop people from riding motorcycles. We don't stop people from smoking. We don't stop people from drinking. All of these activities are dangerous and impose some cost on the community in terms of health expenses. But we don't do that. And similarly, if somebody for some crazy reason refuses to be vaccinated, I don't think we have a right to deny them the usual amenities in a civilized society. After all, they're really endangering themselves and other people like them who are not vaccinated. Social media has played a big part in the way in which the pandemic has been um, handled, reported, discussed in Australia. Of course, populism uh, and elsewhere, of course, populism long predates social media. But I wonder to what extent do you think social media influences 21st century populism? Isn't social media a great leveler which gives all people the capacity to be responsible citizens? That's a very good point. I think one of the reasons why populism is, the rise, is on the rise is the unexpected consequences of the internet and the information age. In a way, you could turn the question around and you can ask yourself, how come that liberal democracy based on this crazy assumption that we can be rational individuals and make rational choices, survived for several hundred years and has been so successful. And the possible answer to that is it survived because 
the populace at large didn't really get much of a say in what happens because of the media, the print media, the electronic media, only a very select upper echelon of rational people had really an input on popular thinking. What the internet brought with it is the potential that everybody has equal access to an audience. And once this happens, uh, we kind of see a regression to the tribal past. If you go on Facebook, within minutes, you can find a bunch of people who happen to believe exactly the same crazy ideas that you happen to believe. And the moment that happens, you think you have a group and it becomes endemic and crazy things are believed by people who do that so in some ways i think the real puzzle is that we managed to survive in liberal democracy for as long as we have and what's happening now is that when everybody else has an equal access to the to the public sphere maybe this period is coming to an end. By the way, this is a very old idea. It goes back to Plato. You know, Plato in the Republic argued against democracy on the basis that people are essentially emotional, irrational, tribal creatures, and they cannot be trusted with running the state. It should be left to intelligent people like philosophers. And maybe the last 300 years has been an example of a de democracy which is run by a small, reasonable elite, where most people don't actually get access to the public sphere. Now that's changing, and so maybe democracy is in danger. Well, look, you've argued that populism is a threat because it appeals to some of our ancient human predispositions and uh, we can trace the, the, the roots of that back a very, very long way. But let me ask you this as we bring this to, to an end, as we wrap up the session. If populism really does represent a challenge to liberal democracy in the way that you say that it does, how do you think we can best respond to that challenge? I can see a couple of uh, possible hopes. One of them is really coming from psychology, my field. I think in the last 20 years, we have made really important headway in understanding for the first time human nature, what sort of creatures we really are. When we talk about the tribal mind, when we talk about Stone Age adaptations, when we talk about the shortcomings of human reasoning ability, uh, Daniel Kahneman, an Nobel Prize winning psychologist wrote about that. We are beginning to understand that we are not essentially open-minded, rational individualists, but we are something else. And that recognition has a value in terms of trying to do something about reaffirming uh, the kind of systems that keep in limit the more irrational aspects of human thinking. The other ray of hope I see is a little bit more uh, well, hard to express. I think liberal democracy has been able to rise to the challenge in situations where it was exposed to very dangerous threats. Uh, fascism and Nazism, when Hitler came to power, liberal democracy was not in the best shape. The United States was isolationist, Great Britain was peace-minded. Uh, essentially, the liberal democratic system seemed weak. Uh, <clears throat> as fascism rose, liberal democracy has uh, rose up to this challenge. And similarly, the Cold War is an example that when faced with a challenge like the Soviet Union, liberal democracies has have found their values and have been able to triumph. There is a remote possibility that with China, which is essentially a totalitarian Stalinist state with a market economy or a limited market economy, if China becomes an international threat, then possibly that will be a wake up call to liberal democracies. And that might also contribute to some ability to reaffirm and find our foundational values which have allowed us to be successful so far. So you're optimistic about the future of liberal democracy? Or do you fear that liberal democracy and with it the Enlightenment project maybe, maybe uh, have, a, have a limited time to run? I think you're an optimist. I'm afraid not. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm more of a pessimist. The, the scenarios I outlined may work, but I, I actually think there is more working against liberal democracy than for it. We need to have a, quite a dramatic reaffirmation of the values of the Enlightenment uh, that John Stuart Mill 
enunciated, we have to have a lot of people who currently remain silent have to become engaged. A lot of people who don't do anything when their colleagues at the university are attacked by woke uh, ideologues have to speak up and not remain silent. And I think that is not something that people are very comfortable with. So no, on balance, I think I'm more pessimistic than optimistic, unfortunately. I think we lived in the best time there ever was, but I'm not convinced that it's going to continue for long. Well, Joe Fogos, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you very much indeed for what's been a very interesting uh, conversation. And my thanks to all of those who, uh, all of you who participated by asking questions and, and, contributed, to, to, and contributed to the conversation. Um, Joe, many thanks. And we look forward to talking to you again before long. And all the very best for the time that remains to you in Hungary. Thank you. And I hope to return as soon as I can. We didn't speak about that, but currently, because of the Australian quarantine rules, thousands of people are waiting overseas, unable to return. And it's amazing to me that this is acceptable to Australians. But thank you for the interest and thank you for the questions. Well, for decades, the CIS has been a fiercely independent voice, working hard to promote sound classical liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved.